Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to another District 6 Listening Circle. Um, I'm Councilmember Jared Williams, and I'm super grateful um, to have such an amazing turnout like we do tonight. Um, it goes without saying that um, we're all here um, because we uh, value the importance of having strong neighborhoods, and strong neighborhoods are safe neighborhoods. Um, and that is the occasion while we're here to talk about um, what does that mean um, here in District 6. Um, I've been particularly concerned, as many of you, um, particularly with um, gun violence um, that has happened um, within the district over the past year um, plus, um, and particularly been concerned um, with gun violence as it relates to our teenagers as well. Um, I, as a councilman, I've been to one too many funerals um, of our young youth who were filled with so much potential um, and their life cut too short. And for me, that's not okay, and that's something that I lose a sleep over. Um, uh, today is, is really an important opportunity, as all of our listening circles, um, to identify issues um, that neighborhoods um, are affected with and then bring our city departments um, who can help um, brainstorm and create solutions, meaningful solutions, um, that address those issues. And that's the purpose of tonight. That's the purpose of our listening circles. And so thank you all um, for being here today. Um, I'm going to give a quick update from a council perspective, um, and then I'll introduce um, Chief Noakes, and then he'll introduce um, the rest of our staff. I want to first of all say thanks to um, our uh, fourth police uh, for being here tonight. Thank you all for your service to our city. Um, thank you, Chief, uh, Commander Hudson, um, your command team, and also our MPOs and some of our patrol staff, I think, is here as well. Um, thank you all for what you all do for the city and for District 6 and for being here tonight. Um, we've been really focused, um, again, on uh, what does it mean to build strong neighborhoods, and from a safety perspective, um, we understand that um, short term there are things that we have to do um, in partnership with our PD um, to ensure that our neighborhoods are safe. Um, and I've been really pleased and honored to be able to work alongside Chief Noakes and his staff. Um, safety is of the utmost importance to them. And they, um, I know Chief Noakes uh, lose sleep and has a couple gray hairs um, um, and trying to. <laughs> Some of y'all got that. <laughs> It has definitely got gray hairs, but this work is really important to him and his team. Needless to say, um, they sacrifice um, time and, um, and so much more um, in this work. So um, it's been an honor to work with him on some of those short-term solutions that you'll hear about today. Um, also, from a council perspective, um, we've been doing things um, um, really related to keeping our neighborhoods safe with respect to finding opportunities for our youth to have spaces to grow and thrive. Um, I'm really pleased to say that um, our team was able to put forward um, a suggestion um, to um, waive the fee uh, for um, youth in the city of Fort Worth not to have to go to communities or not to have to pay to go to community centers. Um, and my colleagues saw the importance of that as well. And so um, this past Tuesday, we were able to vote to ensure that no child will ever have to pay um, an admission fee to be in a safe space like community centers. And so, um, yeah, that's worth a clap. Um, I like to also shout out my district director Kendall. I know he has an old soul, and he's like he seems like he's 35, but he's 19. Um, and we had a conversation where I was like, Kendall, where do kids in Southwest Fort Worth go to hang out? And he said, um, Well, there are not too many places for us. And um, after Tuesday, we have a few more places um, and a few more barriers uh, to keep kids off the streets and in positive spaces. So um, I understand that there's short-term um, solutions that we all have to make. Um, you know, to really address safety immediately. And then there's also long-term things that we need to um, think about and investments that we need to make. Um, and that's why we're focused particularly on the Alta Mesa um, and McCart Corridor. We've submitted um, plans for a reinvestment zone because we recognize that, you know, violent crime and blight um, is, is a symptom of a greater issue of um, economic despair and not enough opportunity. And so um, we're kicking off a working group um, in the next uh, week or so, I think it's December 16th, uh, of neighborhood residents, city staff, PD, fire, um, our economic development team, uh, to talk about what does it mean to create a, another uh, life for Ultimate and McCart um, that includes developing our small businesses, um, leveraging opportunities like our upcoming bond, um, which we'll have meetings in the future about to connect um, the parks, the wonderful parks, um, in Wedgwood with uh, things like security lighting, um, things like trails, um, and things like, um, you know, just beautiful spaces and places uh, in terms of infrastructure and parks um, to continue to serve um, and create that vision of having a vibrant economic center again on McCartan Alta Mesa. 
Um, and so again, we recognize that there are immediate things that we need to solve. Um, also, there's long-term investments that we need to make. Um, and more, most importantly, we can't make any of those solutions without um, you at the table. And so I, I value opportunities like this um, because it's opportunities for us to ask you and the residents of Fort Worth um, to help us in you know, really understanding what does it mean to have safe neighbors here in District 6. Um, and also, um, how do we roll up our sleeves, um, stitches or not? I have six stitches, if y'all are looking at that right. Um, sidebar real quick. Um, I had five stitches on Friday night, and I asked them could they put a six one in because I love District 6 so much. <laughs> so needless to say, though, you know, all of us are here for one reason, because we're willing to roll, roll up our sleeves. Um, we have an amazing uh, community, an amazing district, an amazing city. Um, and definitely there's work to do, and that's why we're all here. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Chief Noakes. Before I do, I have one housekeeping rule. Um, for all of the presenters tonight, when you're coming to speak to the mic, um, I have been um, told that uh, you can't take the mic off the microphone because they're positioned just right. Um, we have uh, um, audience that will be tuned in. This um, conversation tonight will be recorded. Um, and so for your friends and neighbors and family who weren't able to attend tonight, um, we'll be emailing um, the link to this video and also we'll be posting on our social media um, at Jared Williams TX on all platforms. So um, without further ado, we'll be, uh, you'll be hearing from our staff um, and then we'll open the floor up uh, to hear more from you about issues that you've been experiencing I and mean, giving feedback on how we can make some of the solutions that we're presenting to you um, stronger and better and, um, and be meaningful for you, your family, and your neighborhood. So without any further ado, please help me give a warm welcome to our Chief of Police, uh, Chief Neil Noakes. You know, sometimes when we come to these events and a conversation we had earlier today was we wondered, will we have more officers or more citizens to show up. It is nice to see that we're outnumbered tonight. This is actually a really good thing. I'm glad to see the turnout we have. Thank you for being out here. We always value any input we get from the citizens, even if just one shows up. When you show up like this, it, it means a lot to us to be able to hear your concerns and be able to talk to you about the things we need to, need to do to make your community the way it needs to be. Briefly, my vision, our vision, our mission, is to make sure our department is as safe, it's as healthy, and as resilient as it can be to make sure your communities are safe, healthy, and resilient as well. And what that means, number one, like you said, council member, and thank you for not only setting this up, but for inviting us, is safety. If you don't feel safe, if you're not safe in your own neighborhood, then nothing else we do matters. And I'm gonna tell you, you've got a team back here not only have the brains to get the job done, they got the heart to do it right, and they do it every single day for you. Night and day, they're out there serving you and doing some amazing things in the community. Violent crime, that's the biggest thing going on in the nation right now. In my opinion, the biggest thing going on in Fort Worth is again, safety is number one. There was an article recently in CNN that said 63 of the 66 largest jurisdictions in the entire country we're all seeing a spike in violent crime. This isn't just a local issue, this is a national issue. And there are all kinds of people a whole lot smarter than me trying to figure out why that's happening. I say there's a lot of things contributing to it. A lot of guns out there, we, we are confiscating scary weapons. These aren't some cheap pawn shop gun. These are high grade, quality, high capacity guns. And every day we're taking them off the street because of the work people like this are doing every single day. You know, there's a lot of people talk about the pandemic, uh, the economic downturn, uh, all kinds of things that are going on that could contribute to it. But what is important to us, what I believe is important to you, is not what's going on everywhere else in the country. It's what's going on in Fort Worth and specifically in your neighborhoods. That's number one for us, too. We've actually had a push through the summer, an initiative called Fort Worth Safe, where we were going out in communities where we were seeing violent crime. The things we were doing things differently than, we'd seen it, than we had done it sometimes in the past. There were times in the past where we'd go into neighborhoods, we'd send as many officers as we could, we'd pull over everybody we could, we'd arrest everybody we could, there's problems here, we're going to fix it. Well, there are people in those communities that need to be arrested. There are people in the community that need to be taken out, violent predators who are causing damage in your neighborhoods. But the problem is when you take a blanket approach, 
a lot of the people you're negatively impacting are the very people you're trying to serve. We're taking a surgical approach to this using all kinds of data, intelligence, technology, cameras, uh, officers in plain clothes, undercover. We're going after the people who are causing the problems. We're going after people who have guns, people who are selling drugs, people who have guns and are selling drugs. Going after people around here that are driving like idiots, that are trying to bring the car clubs into our neighborhoods. I, I won't say exactly what the, the social media post said. There was one group going to different places throughout the Metroplex and they said, oh yeah, but don't go to, weather, don't go to Fort Worth. I'll change it up, so they don't mess around. The last time they came, we showed up in force. We towed cars, we took people to jail. We took action before they were able to cause damage. Does that mean we stopped every person that could speed in, in Fort Worth? No, but we're doing our best. What our promise is to you is we're gonna continue doing everything we can to positively affect violent crime and again, specifically gun crime and that retaliatory cyclical gun violence you see between warring groups sometimes, we're not gonna tolerate it. We also understand that there's a lot of the areas where you see these problems are areas with blight, areas that have been neglected, areas that maybe don't have the resources other sides of town have where you don't see the violent crime. So what we're also doing is partnering with other organizations, other agencies that can help with community capacity development. If you have a safe, healthy, and resilient community, guess what, it's taking care of itself, is getting things done because the people there have the resources they need. One example, we're partnering with UNT Health Science Center. They are, through a grant, purchasing a mobile clinic that they're gonna wrap with Fort Worth PD and Fort Worth uh, Fire Department logos all over it for free for us. It's not costing the taxpayers anything. And we're taking that mobile clinic, whether it's an eye clinic, dental clinic, maybe kids need physicals for school, we're gonna go out in the community and help. Something we can't offer on our own but we're partnering with the people who can. And please know we're getting out of our silos. You have some experts with that back here that know how to connect with the community, that know that, you know what, you can't fix this alone. We can't fix this alone. But if all of us come together, get on the same page, and work to get things done, I guarantee you we make a difference. Tonight's a listening session, so I'm gonna stop talking. But I do want to introduce some of the staff up here, and then I would like this group back here to introduce themselves and let you know where it is they work. We got some amazing people back here. Hopefully some of you know them. If not, I think you'll have a chance to get to know them. They do incredible things. They're what make the department run. But first of all, I want to recognize one of the assistant chiefs down on the end, Rob Aldridge. He's also my stunt double. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your deputy chief, Greg Weathers. And then we have commander Roy Hudson. All three work here for you. And now putting all of you on the spot, could y'all please come up? I, I, want, I want them to get to know you. And the mics have to stay, but please step up. Come on, you start, Serge. Hi, right. my name is Bob McCarthy. I'm the John District NPO um, Sergeant over here. Um, South Division has two districts, Ida and John. I'm sorry. Yeah, you go through <laughs> Okay. I think I'm done. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back. Um, my name is Bob McCarthy. I'm the John District Sergeant out here in South Division. Um, I have nine officers that, that work with me, that work with the community, that work with the citizens out in the area, the business. Um, we work with just, just about anything, everybody we can work with. Um, and we do a lot of different stuff, too. Um, um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves over here. Go ahead. Uh, those of you that don't know me, I'm Officer Tenorio. I'm in uh, John 19's beat. I've been here for 14 years, uh, about seven or eight years as an NPO. Uh, my border, my borders is on McCart, Risinger, Crowley Road. The majority of mine is residential areas, is what I deal with. So. Hello, my name is uh, Miguel Vargas. Uh, I'm one of the MPOs. I've been here since 01. And uh, the area that I cover is John 14's beat, and that's the Wedgwood area. Are you guys familiar with Wedgwood? It's really big, but it's Granbury to Woodway, 20 to Alta Mesa. So I, really, I like working out here. 
I'm Officer Hayes. Um, I've been with the department for about four years now. My beat is John 18. I started at Columbus Trail in McCart and go as far south as 1187. And then I go across to, I, I always say Bimbrook because it never stops, it seems. <laughs> so. <laughs> My name is Shanae Lopez, um, and I am on loan currently with um, Officer Hayes, working in John 18 as well. I'm Officer Kite. Uh, myself and Tamilia, we're kind of the outcast here. We're way far east uh, from where we're at here. Mine's Ida 19, so uh, you got two different districts, John District and Ida District. Uh, Ida 19 still covers part of the city council members uh, areas, the reason we're up here. We go all the way out to 35, so I'm at around Garden Acres all the way to Burleson. So I realize that's a pretty good ways away from here, but uh, you know what area? I got somebody that's from over there. Uh, so uh, it w since we still come as part of his, uh, we came to this, but uh, we still work for everybody if anybody has anything. I'm Officer Carroll, and I have Ida 18. My south boundary is Sycamore School Road, and like he said, I go out to like McPherson, um, Garden Acres area. Hello, uh, I'm Juan Frias. I'm the supervisor for Ida District. Um, and like you said, Ida 1819 are the only two districts under the councilman's area, but we also have a lot of Chris Nettles and uh, Councilwoman Beck. We have a couple, a couple beats there. But most of Ida is kind of like, I always call it the old south side. I'm from the La Grande Plaza area, kind of born and raised that area, but we've got Highland Hills, um, O.D. Wyatt area, all the way into, we have a little bit of Miller and Wichita area, um, Alta Mesa 35. Most of the 35 corridor is Ida District. Um, but together, like I said, we all work together. We, you know, we'll, we always jump on John's side and they come help us out too. So reach out to us if you need anything. Thank you. I'm Rod Gilbert. I've got the uh, Walmart area. So uh, that generates enough offense reports for the rest of the beat. But, uh, anyway, so I've got uh, John 17 extends north of Sycamore School Road, east of the railroad tracks, northern boundaries Alta Mesa, and then I follow uh, Columbus Trail and uh, West Cleburne. That completes my area. So. Uh, good evening. I'm Officer Brandon Morris. Uh, I have John 16 beat, which is the beat we're in right now. My northern border is Alta Mesa, southern border is Columbus Trail. I go to West Cleburne and all the way to the tollway. How y'all doing? My name is Austin Nash. I've been here 15 years. My beat is John 15's beat, which goes from I-20 coming down to McCart. From McCart, I cut across Alta Mason, go to Vega, and back up. So that's more, mostly of the W's and the businesses along McCart <laughs> and all those areas. So please, at any given time, any time that you all see me, stop me and let me know if you need anything. Our council member from this point, how would you like to uh, proceed forward? Just answer questions from yeah, the group? Yeah, I think just answering questions, oh, I'm Absolutely. not following the rules. Uh, <laughs> I think it'd be great if, um, you know, for those of you who are interested um, in asking particular questions, um, please do that this time. Um, the staff um, is here to share updates on particular concerns that you have, um, and also to hear um, from you. Um, some things that you would like to see. So yeah, please. I'm almost afraid to drive these days. If the light turns green, I'm not going to move because somebody's going to come through a red light. Yesterday, I almost got hit at um, oh, Cleaver Road or whatever it is for that church is fully moving. I, I mean, literally, my life had changed and I got a car with Road yeah, it would was. That, and, and today it was on Alta Mesa and my car. I mean, I stopped. It, I could see these light was turning yellow. By the time I got there, it's red. The car on my left went straight through the red light. What an idiot at, at that intersection. And I never see you guys then. <laughs> I know you can't be every place I am. But I do think that they're wrong. People are just driving like crazy. And they're getting killed, actually, I think. Well, what I would love to do 
is have you get with someone here to give you uh, a contact number because you're right we can't be everywhere all the time but especially when we know there are specific areas where we have issues like this we can concentrate on those areas at least for a limited amount of time when i was uh, long before i became chief i was a sergeant over our motor unit our motorcycle officers we did that all the time a lot of our responsibility was just responding to different parts of the city responding to complaints about speeding running red lights, aggressive driving, whatever it was, and we would be all over the city. But it's not, it wasn't just us. We would coordinate with the NPOs, the men and women you saw here earlier, uh, with the beat officers in the area. Sometimes if it involved large vehicles like 18-wheelers, we'd have our commoter, uh, sorry, commercial motor vehicle enforcement team involved. But you let us know, and again, ho hopefully one of those times we'll be there when you're there, but we can respond and make sure that we're doing everything we can to make it as safe as possible. Yeah, and I'll add from a council perspective, we've also been um, really concerned with high speed traffic. Um, first, address your issue very specifically. If ever uh, you run into intersections that you think are of concern, you can always send that to me and Kendall in our office. I um, mean, we can call not only PD to do like temporary things like uh, maybe send patrol out there um, to monitor, but also we can work with TPW to do speed and traffic studies. Um, those studies help us um, in how we allocate dollars. Um, it may be issues related to the way the intersection is designed, et cetera, and we can advocate for those things once we know there are particular areas of concern and we can make investments to make improvements to that infrastructure. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, Kendall and I have also been working um, to, um, with our school districts to create like speeding campaigns. And so we're working with TPW, they have uh, grant money um, to educate our high school seniors. I know I was in high school once not too long ago, um, and I didn't always drive slow on this street out here on Alta Mesa. Um, but I had, um, you know, first of all, God definitely saw fit to keep me from danger when I was doing stupid things. Um, but also, um, you know, there's a lot of great adults out here who are willing to coach up our teens on how to drive responsibly. And so um, those are a couple of things that we're doing. And that's one way that if you see in all of y'all, if y'all see um, intersections that just really don't look safe, you can reach out to our council office. I mean, we can do a study on that um, on that particular intersection. I will say there's a couple that we've made improvements on. Um, one right here um, at Alta Mesa and Grand Bear because you all in the last uh, two listening circles ago, y'all had brought up that intersection, the striping, et cetera, and so we were able to get it restriped. Um, Brian Irvin and Alta Mesa, we were able to um, work with the developers of Tavolo Park to reconstruct that intersection because it just wasn't safe. Um, we're also working with developers as we're growing southwest to make sure that as they're building new rooftops and, and new projects, that they're also ensuring that we're also ensuring that they have adequate infrastructure like stop signs, street lights, so that high speed traffic and speed racing um, isn't happening in some of our newer parts of the district that um, we're currently under development. So um, it's definitely a concern of ours as well. And so please uh, stay in contact and help us identify some of those places. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else? My name is Marvin Champlin, and I think Hi, uh, Dr. Williams yeah. knows all my physicians on various things. But just to tell you why I'm here tonight, I live in Wedgwood. Lived there for a long time. And over the past two years, it's been slowly becoming what's known as Wedgehood. And it has a substantial number of uh, violent crimes, but also, as you know, but also the petty crimes. The criminals that are starting here are going to become uh, the criminals that become the violent criminals. Or they're getting, uh, the, doing the petty crime in order to support the drug crime. Uh, we see um, drug deals, I have seen drug deals, on the schoolyard at J.T. Stevens. That's not unusual. Um, we've seen uh, and, and lately had two murders within a mile of my house. One at Kingswood mm -hmm. and uh, Alta Mesa, and one at, uh, at Hewlin and, and, uh, uh, and uh, Alta Mesa. I'm sorry, that's not. That was the 15 year old with a gun that came over from the east side, held up a woman in her apartment, and then came back and raped her. Mm. Uh, this is unacceptable in our community. It's never been this way. I've lived here for a long time. It's never been this way. 
um, and my question is, <laughs> because I've raised all this stuff with, with uh, Dr. Williams, but uh, do you work with uh, uh, the uh, code enforcement people concerning, uh, you know, making sure that apartments, um, the uh, rental properties that are along Alta Mesa and, and elsewhere, uh, and the business properties, and one in particular, that's a strip shopping center that looks like hell. Looks like a war zone to an old soldier. So uh, I'm asking if you work with, if you can and will work with the uh, code enforcement people to support you in an effort to make those areas better and get the owners, get the owners involved. Thank you. Great question, and thank you for your service, sir. Um, absolutely, uh, absolutely. We actually work with code compliance frequently. Brandon Bennett is the uh, director of code compliance and very active, very active guy. Um, we have worked on properties before, and we also have worked with city legal, our city attorney's office, on areas that are consistent problems. Those fixes are great, but they're not quick fixes. Unfortunately, there are hoops that have to be jumped through some people learn the loopholes, which hit a reset button on the process. Uh, we've actually had some very recent wins, though. Uh, some on the, the southeast side of Fort Worth. Smokies is shut down now, if you didn't know. They actually shut that one down. If there are areas we need to look at that we're not looking at, you think we're not aware of, again, please let us know. If you see something, say something. If you hear something, say something. You know something, say something. We are only as good as the intel we receive, we're only as good as the cooperation we get from the community. We have, in my opinion, the best officers in the world that you'll find anywhere. But we need the community's help to know where to focus. Because you think of that area you're talking about, how many businesses are there? And if we try to get Brandon Bennett and his very small crew, unfortunately, we're, a lot of us are small. Hey, we're trying to be good stewards of the money you give us. And we're not, we can't go out and just hire 100 people for code compliance. Brandon would love that. But unfortunately, we're not able to. I will say we have a city council that supports us and does everything they can to get us the resources we need. What we do is try to find the most effective and efficient way to use those resources. So instead of taking Brandon and going from business to business to business, we would love input. We would love information on, hey, this is one of those locations you might want to take a look at. Or I saw drug dealing over here. I think we've got an issue with this one because there are a lot of tools in the toolbox, and some of them aren't ours. Some of them are code compliance. Sometimes it's public work. Sometimes it's something the council members are able to come up and say, hey, you know what, I've got an idea too. But working with gentlemen like you who have information, I'm sure you'd be willing to share. I believe we can actually get something done working with code compliance and others like that to address those areas. Else? Yeah, I've also volunteered uh, Marvin that he's going to serve on our working group for the reinvestment zone for Alta Mesa McCart. So you can definitely see his passion. And um, we have great neighbors like that that are helping us make um, some really great strides. So thank you again for your service to the city and for that question. Um, I will say um, in terms of violent crime, um, we had a meeting uh, not too long ago. Um, there's also a lot of uh, technological things that we can do in, in addition um, to sending code compliance officers and patrol officers and MPOs um, to particular locations. And we're looking into making those investments as well. Um, of course, that takes time and, and planning those resources. But um, I know they've talked about things like cameras and other types of technology um, that we can use to help kind of um, make our resources go a lot further. And so, um, you know, Chief, would you mind giving just a very short update about like different technological things we can do? Absolutely. Uh, cameras have been a game changer for us. Technology hurts us sometimes because the technologies the criminals have, but sometimes it helps us tremendously. We talked earlier about having technology assist us in knowing who to target. So it's not just a blanket approach, it's a specific approach. We have cameras throughout the city that will run license plates. And they will tell us, okay, that vehicle's stolen. Or somebody in that car has a felony warrant. Let's go stop that car. Instead of maybe stopping the soccer mom or somebody who's coming home after working a double shift, well, we might stop you, I don't know. <laughs> 
or somebody's just trying to get home after working a double shift, let's go after the person who, again, selling the drugs, who's got the guns in the community. Those cameras allow us to do that. I talked with the, uh, the founder and CEO of this one company called Flock, Flock Cameras. And he said, what problem are you having with our cameras? And this isn't me trying to promote a company. This is just a conversation I had with the gentleman. He said, what problems do you have with the cameras? I said, the problem is you're giving us so much, we don't have enough people to make all the stops we need to. That's good information to have. That is good information to have. That has allowed us to do a lot of things differently. Something else, our investigative abilities with what we have, it's called a real-time crime center, with officers watching cameras, watching these areas where we have problems, where drugs are being sold, where we know people, maybe gang members are hanging out with weapons, shooting at one another. We've caught people on camera shooting at one another. We were able to solve a homicide by tracking back through our cameras after we located a suspect, saw where they dumped the body. We've been able to solve some crimes that quite honestly, I don't know if we ever would have before. We have one piece of software where if someone says, okay, between noon and four o'clock, there was a red truck that drove by and I think they're the ones that shot. It'll go back through all our cameras, look at that time frame and pull out just the red truck so we can narrow down exactly what we want to look at. Instead of watching four hours of video looking for a truck. We have so many different things now that help us be more specific and in tune with what we need to be doing in our investigations. It's, it's been a complete game changer for us. It's a, it's a for, force multiplier for us because we know exactly what we need to, do, need to do and where we need to go. And we're working on expanding that technology even more. Just so you know, we are not using it to spy on anyone. We actually have some people who fear we're using it to look in their windows and, and it, it is not like that. We're using it to make you safer, period. And it's working. Thank you for that. We have two in the back. Denise, if you'd like to go ahead and then. Oh, okay. Okay, please, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Come back to me. Okay, I will. Promise. How do we contact our MPO? So how about we do it like this? Um, can one of y'all coordinate with her to see where she lives so that we can Absolutely. pair you with your specific MPO? How can we find out when they come? I've got that one. Yeah. Okay, if you will go on the Fourth Police Department website, just Google Fourth Police Department. If you'll scroll down, there's a section like a ribbon across the screen. It says one address. Start typing your address in. It, it will auto-populate. Click on that, it will tell you who your MPO is, give you their phone number, your commander, your crime prevention specialist, the location of the nearest police station. It will give you a ton of information. Th there's actually a lot of really good stuff on our website, and uh, we probably don't do a good enough job of getting that out so you know what to look for. We even have a crime mapping uh, piece on there where you can go on you can put in what you want to look at, the area you want to look at, the time frame you want to look at, and it will show you the crimes that are happening in that area. There's a lot of information on the website that could help out a ton, but if nothing else, remember one address, start typing it in, let it auto-populate, click on it, and all that information will be right there for you. And we work hard to keep that updated as much as possible. The good news, especially when it comes to NPOs, we try to leave them in place long term. It's about building relationships. And if you're changing every week, every month, every six months, you don't get to build those relationships. We've got a lot of MPOs who have actually been in their areas for years, and we want to keep it that way. Come to the mic. <laughs> this is uh, my district director, Kendall Locke. <laughs> but also, too, on one address, it's, of course, it has where you can find the MPO, but it also has you can find your uh, neighborhood code officer. Uh, you can find our information, our phone number, uh, email address. It has literally everything that pertains to your particular address, the nearest police station. Um, it has the nearest community center. Everything is there. So uh, if you never can find it, type in one address in Google, Fort, City of Fort Worth, one address, and it'll pull up. Thank you, Kendall. Denise, back at you. Um, my name is Denise Turner. I represent, I'm the president of Summer Creek South Homeowner Association. I want to let you know I think you guys are doing an amazing job. Thank I you. want to actually also say One Address is an incredible tool. It's a phenomenal tool. It has a plethora of information out there, as well as the My Fort Worth app. So there's your plug from me, okay? <laughs> um, but Thank I do you. have a couple of questions. One regarding um, the technology, just to capitalize on that um, subject matter, you had mentioned you have a lot of tools at your disposal. And I know at one point 
there was discussion about possibly adding drones um, as well as additional resources. I think about a year ago there was talk about adding additional resources. Because we're, our areas, our communities are expanding, there's developing happening everywhere and my concern has been and always will be how are you supporting the infrastructure at the pace that it's growing. So I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Yes, we do have drones. That's, that's a brand new technology in law enforcement and a lot of different new rules, regulations, laws pertaining to that are coming around. Uh, we're, we're learning about it and how to use it right now. There's actually some re pretty amazing stuff being done with the drones. I have not been directly involved with the, with the technology, so I'm not going to try to act like I know. But I will tell you, we have some very smart people who are involved with the program who are trying to be on the leading edge of what we can do. Uh, and there's uses not only from surveillance, uh, there is mapping of accident scenes like the 133 car pileup that happened. We didn't have the technology yet, but we called in a company who could map that entire scene in a matter of minutes where it would have taken us hours, if not days, doing it the old way. I used to do that job as an accident reconstructionist for the department, it would have taken forever. There's things that are helping us be more efficient in the way we're doing things. Uh, so we try to leverage technology as much as we possibly can because, again, it helps us to be able to do the job not only more efficiently, we can do it uh, more cost efficiently as well. And I know the council members, our city leadership, the city manager's office, the mayor, if there's some technology we need, they're going to do what they can to help us get it. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it's very expensive. But we're doing what we can to make sure we're staying on top of things. And was that your full question, or was there more you were asking yeah, about the growth and the infrastructure? I, I just wanted to know a little bit more because it was, uh, again, it was a topic of discussion a couple of quarters back about adding some additional technology as well as additional resources. I think there was some talk about adding more officers, more feet on the street. Um, so I wanted to know where you were with that. Have you actually expanded your department to add more feet on the street because of where we're at, we're Charleston University. I know that it was anticipated to bring at least 10,000 more residents to this community yes. just with that university alone. Yes. And my concern was, how are you going to support this infrastructure and this rapid growth with resources? Because more people means more potential activity. Absolutely. So how are you, how are you balancing that within our community? We so have increased that? our numbers as a police department. Our, our uh, allotted staffing level right now is 1,743. Wasn't that long ago. We were in the 1600s. We're 1,743 right now. We recently just added some sergeants and some detectives to our ranks. Uh, and over the years, we've been increasing the number. We actually had a staffing study done by a, a consulting group called Matrix several years back. They put something in place that, yes, you need more officers. And going forward over this many years, this is how many you need. We worked it out with the city. Things were going well. Then, bam, a pandemic. There was a real fear about the economic impact in Fort Worth. Luckily, we really fared better than a lot of communities across the country. But it kind of put a damper on what we had planned. But, again, we have council members, a city manager, and a mayor who want to give us what we need to get the job done. But we also understand for every dollar, every extra dollar that goes to PD, that's one less extra dollar that goes to the streets you need out there. That's one less dollar that goes to the libraries you need, the fire department you need. The community deserves the best of everything. And obviously, we need more officers, and we're working on getting that, but we're trying to be good partners with everyone else in the city. What I want you to know is as we're working on those numbers, as our staffing numbers are starting to climb, because we're, let me tell you this, we're 114 officers down right now. Of the 1,743 we're allotted, we're 114 down from that number. We've got a class of 45 graduating on the 17th of this month. A class has got about 41 is going to graduate in May. We start a class of 66 or 67 in January and another class of about the same in June or July. So we are getting our numbers up there. And before I can really go to city council and say, Dr. J, I need 100 more officers. I got to at least show I can get up to the staffing level we have now. The issue is we're having more attrition now. We're having more officers who are leaving the profession. Some are retiring because it's time. They've done 25, 30, 35 years. What's concerning is when you see officers leave who haven't even met retirement yet. They're fed up with policing. It's not like they're leaving to go to another agency. 
They're fed up with policing. What I will say is in Fort Worth, we don't see it like other agencies. I say this all the time. When you look at other large cities across the country, I, I challenge you to find one that has a community that supports the police department like we do. I don't think you're going to find one. And because of that, I think we're faring a lot better. The last thing I'm going to say on it, even though we are down, even though we are struggling to get to that number we want to be at, and we will get there, these people you see in these uniforms go out every day doing extra work to get the job done to make sure you're safe. I can't be more proud to be a part of that team. I can't be more proud to be their chief. They make me proud every single day, and it's, it's what keeps me going. And I'll just add, add to that, Chief, through amazing alley-oop. Um, you know, we recognize the staffing issues as a council, uh, not only with PD, also with um, fire, um, especially to your point, us growing Southwest. Um, some of the things that I've been in conversation with, particularly as we continue to grow Southwest, um, is ensuring that we have the opportunity between this bond that's coming up in May and the next bond, which is 2026, which is a long time, and a lot of development is going to be happening between then, to say between those bonds, how do we still get the resources that we need to make sure that we have first responders in, a, in as we continue to grow Southwest? And so um, we're able to do things like have temporary stations, um, and there's funds um, generally available based on the need in the city for us to do those kinds of things to get us to the next bond to build permanent stations. Uh, so that's something that we're very um, on top of um, with this upcoming bond, making sure that if we don't get a police or fire station that we're planning for the growth with temporary stations to get us the next bond. Um, the other thing I want to say is um, with the staffing needs, um, we also um, have been working really hard on council. Some of y'all may have seen the meeting. Um, particularly with our fire, we've ha we've requested as a council for a staffing study, um, and so w that is in the works. And so you'll see that coming back um, in 2022, and for the next budget cycle, we'll be addressing that as well. Um, the other thing I will say is I think it's really important that um, we grow our next generation of public servants. Um, to Chief's point, and we've been working on a homegrown heroes initiative. Um, we're partnering with Crowley ISD and with Ford Police and Fire. Um, to basically create a program for high school juniors and seniors um, to choose a career pathway um, in fire, police, EMT, and dispatch or emergency communications. Um, that's something that we haven't talked about today, but um, our 911 call centers, um, we've, we've had staffing issues, not just in the city of Fort Worth, all across the county. Um, and that's something that is an amazing career opportunity um, if, if we can you know, connect kids to those opportunities and connect their passion to those opportunities as well. Um, and so with that program, we're looking at things like, um, can we pay for work study uh, for kids while they're in high school in their junior and senior year to make a living, right, while they're in school uh, to pursue this career? Things like partnering with TCC and Tarleton State um, to ensure that if they want to go pursue um, uh, college education in a related field, that they're able to do that and that we're paying for that as well. I mean, ultimately, that there's a job waiting for them in the budget, in the city budget on the, on the end of it. Uh, we met with Dr. McFarland, who's the superintendent of Crowley ISD, um, and they can, they, they can create programs in partnership with us. They're all in for that. Their biggest thing is we want to make sure that there's a job for that child at the end of it because um, that's a game changer for, for our families here. And so um, that's another um, initiative that we're working on to address some of the staffing issues, um, and we're hoping that that will launch um, in, in the fall. So. Um, excellent questions. The one other thing I'll hit is infrastructure. Um, we're working constantly with developers to make sure we have other things that keep neighbors safe, like sidewalks, uh, school zones, crosswalks, um, lighting, lighting in parks, security uh, measures in parks as well. Um, and all of those things are things that we need your help on. When you see things that we can make improvements on, please send that to our office. We can route that to TPW and work with um, other departments to, um, to try to solve those issues as well. So thank you. Mm -hmm. One other very important topic, and I can't believe I didn't think of this when you talked about infrastructure and service to this growing area. Part of the 2018 bond package, which the voters of Fort Worth approved, thank you, included a new division, a new police station for South Division. And it's, I've seen the artist renderings, it's beautiful. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, and I, actually, I'm going to ask Deputy Chief Greg Weathers if he'll come up and talk about it. He was the commander in South Division when this whole process started and he's <laughs> stayed on it he's stayed on it since and I'm gonna tell you what if you if you want an advocate 
for something like this, this is your guy because he's been a bulldog and he hasn't let go. So I'll let you talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. The mic is not for vertically challenged people. So, uh, so just so you know, like you said, the chief mentioned, in 2018 we got the bond package for the South Division building. Um, it's about 32,000 square feet. We'll have about close to 200 people working in that facility. Um, initially, the construction was going to start in about 2019. COVID hit. We had to change builders. There were some more issues going on. So finally, at this point, we're actually hopefully getting closer to actually starting to move some dirt build it up we're hoping it's done by 2023 we'll have right now you have a sector at mccart um I'm trying to give you a good idea maybe mccart and sycamore. sycamore then you have one at 3128 west bolt so we have two officers stationed in separate areas right so our idea is to combine those officers in one facility and it's going to be south at mccart and risinger and the reason is that we're looking at the growth and that's where a lot of the growth is right also across from us is going to be a brand new library so Part of our facility that we're going to have, we're going to have a community room. We're going to have a workout room for officers. We're going to have a lot of things inside of this facility that we just don't have. Currently, the Bolt office was built in maybe 1960, and we're renting space by the Domino's, so we get Domino's pizza, not free very often. Yeah, yeah. So, and not good for cardio. <laughs> yeah, and not good for the officers. So, and I know the young lady asked the question about John 18. Your, your MPO is Officer Hayes. Oh, there she is. She's right there next to you. Uh, I will tell you that um, Assistant Chief Aldridge and I have already been talking about looking at the beat sizes, and that impacts call load, response time, and some of those things. So that's something that we are looking at. Is John 18 is big, and it's getting bigger, and John 16 is also big in that area as well. So we are looking at maybe doing a beat alignment, but it may take a year. But hopefully when the building comes in place, we'll have all new boundaries because we've just got so much growth in all parts of the city that we're going to have to look at realigning. And when we do a realigning, we go back and we look at call load. So we do staffing based by call load. So that way we can say, hey, South Division needs, I'm going to say 100 more officers, right? <laughs> I won't get them, but I'll ask for them. So that's I'll just, to, <laughs> yeah, there we go. So that's typically what we do is anytime we get that growth, we start to look at the city's growing. How do we respond? What do we do to uh, decrease our response time? And we also look at the MPOs because an MPO, if they have an area like John 18 by themselves, they're busy. You have schools, you've got colleges, you've got 20 residential neighborhoods easily, which is hundreds of people easy. So we do look at all of those things to address the growth in the city. Next question. Yes, ma'am. I live one block south of Alton Mesa from the Y. If you went straight out my backyard and crossed Alton Mesa, you'd mm -hmm. wind up in that Y sports complex. Mm -hmm. And I garden. I'm out in my yard a lot. And the street racing along Alton Mesa, particularly in warm weather from about 9.30 to 10.30 or 11 at night, I swear I keep waiting to hear loud booms and crashes. And it's just, I know you can't be everywhere all the time. And the other thing is, the, a similar thing, not quite so bad, happens when Southwest High School gets out at 340 every day. Right. And there's screeching of tires and truck people trying to beat the red light. And, but it's the, the street racing in the evening after dark in the summertime when I'm most likely to be out in my yard sitting there enjoying myself after I put in a hard day gardening. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted you to, to try to make note of that. It probably will slow down with the colder weather, but in the summertime when I'm out, I'm particularly aware of it. Right. I will tell you with the street racing, racing it's a problem nationwide. Um, one of the things that we run into is it's put on social media and they can have 20 cars show up in 15 minutes, right? So as we get that information, then it's up to us to try to respond. Well, patrol has a response for accidents, violent crime. That is their very first priority. Now we do have a director response unit and they've had a lot of success because if we can catch a flyer from a car club, we, we just got invited to the meetup, right? <laughs> so a lot of that does happen. And I will tell you the MPOs have been really good about adjusting their schedule, but it's just like going fishing, right? Sometimes you catch a lot of fish, sometimes you don't catch anything. And it's hard because they're, they're having to adjust their hours, they're working days and they go nights. They can spend a week on nights and I promise you they will not catch one person 
then the day they go back to day shift, there'll be 15 cars that raced up and down McCart. So we are aware of it and we try to address it, but it is something that is continually, it happens at the drop of a hat. It's very quick and easy, but it is something that we are trying to address the best we can. Yeah, and again, I think um, in addition to everything that has been said, um, it's also important that we're looking at the traffic um, patterns in some of these corridors. Alta Mesa is a really important one because of things like that. I um, mean, so we're able to do traffic studies and we have done one on that one. Um, and through this reinvestment work and our bond work, um, we're trying to figure out ways that we can find dollars to make some improvements that um, recondition the flow of traffic so that the speeds aren't as high or, or not at a high rate. So. Um, thank you for that. And if you, like they said, if you hear things, um, Chief said it earlier, if you hear things, you know, please reach out to us, um, whether it's um, you hearing about um, something that's going down in the neighborhood in terms of racing in particular, or if you just have seen consistent high speed traffic um, in a given week, let us know and we can coordinate with the team as well, okay? Um, we have time maybe for. Sorry, just real yeah. quick, Councilman Williams. Please. So my name is Brandy. Um, I just graduated my last son from Southwest High School and I know the principal Ingalls you tell him Brandy Gonzalez volunteered you he thinks like, <laughs> yeah I don't doubt it if you reach out to him about the issues that you have with the students at Southwest he will get on it he's a wonderful principal he's about students but he's also about the community let him know I will definitely be sending an email to him tomorrow and letting him know that this is something that needs to be addressed and <laughs> officers and campus monitors that they can put out there after school and if you include us, um, the, our council office on that as well, we would love to follow up on it too. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, I saw two hands. Um, I see three hands right now, and I know the camera guy is probably going to really hate me, but let's do all three. If y'all can make it um, really quick so that we can honor all three of your questions, okay? Yes, sir. My name is uh, Yusuf Howard. I live hey. in Summer Creek South. And the majority of the questions that I had you've answered was regarding staffing. I did make a phone call. I called in uh, a few months back. There was uh, some folks that had loud music at Life Church. Uh, it was 2 in the morning, response time. I don't know if you guys actually ever showed up, to be honest with you. I know there's probably other things. I did speak with Officer Hayes, and I haven't seen that again. But we still have, like most areas, the, the street racing, the the donuts at Risinger mm -hmm. and Summer Creek, mm -hmm. you know, that's yeah. growing. Uh, but and, and with staffing, I understand that. I appreciate all the technology, but you really, technology can only take you so far. Mm -hmm. You really need to have boots on the ground. That's what's more effective. My question with this is, do you guys have a mutual aid agreement with maybe Crowley PD or somewhere else where when you're having issues, because what I'm noticing is, the crimes that they're speaking about in uh, the Wedgwood area and all those, I'm starting to see that starting to shift yeah. towards yeah. this way. Yep. Yeah. And if you can't get a handle on it there, it just starts to just grow and grow and grow. Exercise. Start yeah. pushing from here and start pushing back and wipe all of it out. Mm -hmm. I know that's a, a big order, it's a tall <laughs> ask, but it is something that, you know. Right, and I'll tell you that the when we did uh, mutual aid agreements or worked with somebody, we brought in DPS. So DPS brought in probably about 50 officers. They said, I didn't bring enough, right? So the thing about it is when you bring in different officers, they don't know everybody, right? So they don't always know the hot, hot spots, the areas. They don't know what you're individually dealing with. So it's good to do those agreements when you have something in, um, with a defined goal. But if you just say, I want to address street racing, we don't want DPS to address street racing. That's not what their primary goal is, right? So we do work with other agencies if we needed to. Um, Crowley, they're primarily just starting their school district PD. I know they do have their regular officers, but I can tell you they just don't have enough officers on the street for, the, for their own issues they're dealing with. So it's just a, it's a cycle of trying to get a lot of bodies out here, and always just putting more officers on the street doesn't always address the crime, right? Some of it has got to be education for the individuals. Hey. Street racing is dangerous. You can kill yourself. You can kill someone else. And those are some of the avenues that we do. We'll also use Next Door. We'll put out all kinds of, you know, just general information as far as we use our Facebook, we use our Instagram, we use Twitter. So we do things as just public education. Um, it's just really trying to continue to stay on top of that education so that the young individuals that are primarily younger drivers that are doing it start to understand that, hey, this is a safety issue for everybody in the community, not just for yourself. So if you're saying that, that what you're saying is, if I'm hearing correctly, 
when DPS came in, visibility of more officers on the street that doesn't deter. Is that it's it's not it's crime is is very transient and crime is happens just at the drop of a hat, right? And it it helps with some people, but it doesn't just stop crime, because I can tell you we can have a hundred DPS officers lined up and down McCart, right? And then we could have a robbery two blocks off of McCart. I mean, it's, it's just people, if they decide to do the crime, we do our best to have that availability and that presence, but it doesn't always deter someone from committing a crime. We, would, we wish it would, right? Because I could put out 100 cars with nobody in them, right? <laughs> right, but I'm just saying in general, that's what we, we do hope that our presence does deter crime, and it does to a certain extent, but it doesn't always deter crime. And I think that's why it's important that when we're talking about addressing issues like you mentioned, which are really important, that we're doing it from a comprehensive way, right? That we're using multiple strategies and working with community to identify um, places that are areas of concern to make sure that we're addressing that. So, um, well received. Chief, did you want to add anything to that before? Some pretty good intelligence from the folks that I'm hearing here because they're giving specific location where these are happening. I've given specific location mm -hmm. and time where things are happening. So I, again, I appreciate the technology, but folks here are saying this is where it's happening. These are the times that it's happening. So and that's why we're here. You know, that's, that's why we're here. Unfortunately, we haven't acted on what we heard today. You got to give us a little time to act on the intel we're getting here. But what I can tell you is we will. Yep. And something else, talking about working with other agencies, I kind of, I think I understood what you were saying about coming from both ends and getting in the middle. We work with, we have crime analysts that look at all these issues. We have crime prevention specialists who work in the neighborhoods. We have information we're able to collect while these other agencies collect information as well. The good thing there is a, a network of these crime analysts that share information. A lot of our detectives will work with detectives and other agencies say, hey, we're seeing this problem. Are y'all too? Oh, you're dealing with the same person we are. All right, let's combine our resources and do something about it. So we do work with local, county, state, and federal partners. I mean, we're working with the DEA, FBI, HSI, everybody we possibly can to get at ATF, everybody we can to make sure we're pulling and bear, bringing all resources to bear that we can. And you're right, we, could I put a, if I could put an officer on every corner, would that, be, would that be great? Well, it depends on who you ask. Some would say yes, some would say no, it's a little bit too much. But yeah, absolutely, we're gonna, we're gonna get as many officers as we can get as we're able to get them. And we know that our council and our city is gonna work with us to do that. We're doing the best, I guarantee you, with what we have right now. And part of that is partnering with other agencies for that full force multiplier, because you're right, technology is great, but it will never replace folks like this right here. So with the staffing that you're bringing in, how many officers, new recruits that are coming in, will be in this area, this district? Sure. So, I, I know th that is a very important question. We're running short on time. Sure. Let's link up after the meeting. We'll dive really deep into it. I want to be able to um, honor the last two questions of the night, and we'll close out. But please connect with me. Um, I, it sounds like we might have some opportunities to put you on a working group as well. So, <laughs> thank you for your passion and and for you know lifting up those perspectives is really important. Um, Ma'am, please. <coughs> I work with a group called Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. Yes, so, and with the tragic event that happened this past week, mm -hmm. what does Fort Worth ISD bring to the table and, and the police department? How are y'all working with the high schools and with the other schools to prevent these tragedies? So, I'll speak from the council perspective and then I'll pass it to Chief. Um, for me, um, you know, my parents were educators. My dad just retired from South Hills High School. Um, and so, and my, back, my background is in education. And so, um, partnerships with our school districts are really important to me. Um, in fact, um, I have, um, we're starting a regular meeting with uh, Trustee Ann Dar and Anael Luebenos, who are fourth ISD trustees um, that overlap and share boundaries so that we can address specific issues. Because sometimes um, the school district doesn't have the resources um, and sometimes the issues that we need them to solve are not in their lane, they're in the city's lane. I mean, so if we're not coordinating and having meetings together, it's hard to know what those issues are. So one, um, I think it's important that elective representatives between school districts I mean, the city um, build that partnership. And you've seen that a lot um, with this particular council with the mayor's leadership and her background in education as well. 
Um, the second thing we've been working on, I think it's important that we have um, strong relationships with our particular schools. Um, we do tons of community events at our schools intentionally to build those relationships. Um, and then also we work with, um, you know, departments like TPW, uh, specifically with the speed issue. Um, we're working on a, a speed awareness campaign through the grant that they have to address some of the issues like um, folks burning out of the school parking lot ready to go home or to McDonald's or all the fun places that we all went to after high school is out, right? Um, and so we're partnering with um, departments like that on specific initiatives to address some of the issues um, that are experiencing. So needless to say, um, I'm all in for any partnerships that we can um, continue to make with our school districts. Chief. Uh, this question brought up something to mind. I, have, I failed to introduce Nicole Garcia right here, my executive assistant. If it wasn't for Nicole, I wouldn't even be here today. She's, she's the one that makes sure I get where I need to go. I bring her up because we were at a meeting recently with Dr. Scribner, the superintendent of Fort Worth ISD and his director of security, uh, Mr. Danny Garcia, who's retired from Fort Worth PD. That was the first topic we talked about. School safety, violence in schools, active shooters on school property, what the Fort Worth PD and Fort Worth ISD can do together to partner to make sure our schools are as safe as they absolutely possibly can be. Number one discussion we had, and it's an ongoing conversation, is going to include training on school property, training at our facility, bringing Fort Worth ISD staff to our facility to train, but also training at the schools to make sure we're giving tools and resources in how to respond. They have, uh, you know, responding to an active shooter is not something that we ever want anyone to ever have to experience in Fort Worth, but it's already happened once, well, more than once at churches, multiple churches here in Fort Worth. And we pray to God it never happens at a school, but we're gonna make sure we're prepared, working with Fort Worth ISD to make sure the staff and the school, the students are as prepared as they can be in the, in the unlikely, well, in the God forsaken uh, instance that, that you know, hopefully never happens in our city. And then the last one was you, sir. Yes, sir. You guys have answered a whole lot of questions because I, I don't think there's near enough police officers that we have in Fort Worth. By the time everybody gets out of school, that you, we're going to be short then. The Fort Worth is growing too fast. Yeah. My question is to tie in with all of this. I know you guys can't be everywhere. This is impossible. Uh, what if I see somebody cutting my catalytic converters off, which happened? <laughs> Do I just stand there, wave by, I'll see you next time. Uh, what can we do? I mean, I know you, you're not going to get there in time to do anything. So what recourse do the property owners have? You know, I, I don't encourage you to engage. I don't. Your safety is more important than that catalytic converter to me. Is it expensive? Yes, it is. Well, something, but something I want you to know is don't think we take catalytic converter theft lightly. We're actually part of several task forces. We have a group that's working on catalytic converter thefts in Fort Worth, some of our detectives and officers who've actually uncovered international rings for catalytic converter theft. The precious metals in those catalytic converters are ridiculous. I mean, you go to F-250, what do you walk away with $1,000 in three minutes? So we're actually, we're going after not only the people that are stealing them, but anyone that's buying them, including businesses. And through that, we have made some significant arrests. We're trying to find new ways to help identify things, identify people. But it was, I'll be honest, it kind of shocked me when I found we were actually able to uncover an international converter theft or catalytic converter theft ring. So my, you're asking my advice, and I will give it. Your life is not worth that catalytic converter, as expensive as it is. We ask that we call you. Can I guarantee you we'll get there before that person leaves? I can't. I wish I could. But I would much rather get there to take a report from you about your catalytic converter being stolen than from your neighbor because you maybe were run over, shot, and killed because you tried to stop the person. That's the reason I say what I do. I understand the frustration for us not getting there as quickly as you would like. I understand it. I've had to call the police before myself. It's frustrating. But your safety for me is more important than any property ever could be. And I'll just go what the chief just said in reference to the calendar converters. <coughs> that's coming from the mic. The way the folks at home can listen. Any, anything going on around your home, gather your information. Gather information. While things are going on, we want to thank everybody. All of you all have great security systems around your home. You all have cameras, you have ring cameras, 
you have all this information that you can gather. If someone is doing something around there, just try your best. Get a description of the person. If the person is driving a vehicle, try to get their license plate number. Any information that you all give us is valuable because we can use that information and we'll find it. Just the next day, we'll see the license plate. Our camera pick it up. Okay, boom. We know that person was involved in a crime. Now we can follow that vehicle where it went to. And then lo and behold, as she just said, that's how the rings are being really somewhat discovered because we're finding the individuals at that point of time whenever they're doing it, going somewhere else committing more crime. So to you, sir, gather information. You know, the license plate, the vehicle, the height, weight of the person that you see, any information that you all can gather will be outstanding. Real and quick. Uh, in reference to that on next door, which I'm on every day, people are always on there every day, something like mm -hmm. that has happened. It was here a few weeks ago, uh, some people pulled up in broad daylight, two guys, they parked right beside the car, one got out and jacked it up, the other one got over there and sawed them off. And there was somebody in the neighborhood saw what was going on with his camera, he comes up filming these people. <laughs> they led it down. I'm sorry, propane torch, and chase the guys doing the filming off with a propane torch. Now, I mean, what, what can that? Yeah, that's. Those people like that, I mean, they're just going to keep doing it and keep doing it. And that guy, I hate to say, I, that, it just. I, I will say I, I feel that frustration as well. One of my family members recently, um, their catalytic, uh, catalytic converter um, was taken. Um, and recently we had a council meeting talking about this very thing. And I was really impressed that we had experts specifically on catalytic converters in this in our uh, Fort Worth PD. Um, and one of the things that I asked during that meeting was, what, well, what can we do? And there are some things that we can do. If you do have a garage, you know, ensuring that you're able to park it in as much as often. Um, if you're able to secure your car in any kind of way, um, do those kind of things. Um, our team is doing um, our very best to make sure that we're um, addressing the ring aspect of that to make sure that um, those catalytic converters aren't able to be purchased, right? If we're able to do that, then it's less valuable um, back on the street. So um, it's certainly a tough challenge to solve. And, um, you know, I feel your pain as well. And that's something that um, we got to work on and that um, your perspective that you lifted up, we're taking that back to the city hall to continue working on. something you could suggest, a, a surefire way, I think, of stopping that is don't, you can't sell a catalytic converter unless it's attached to the car. <laughs> I will take that back and see if we can do a resolution on that, actually. That might be a good ordinance there. I, I'm going I'm to get your name and maybe we'll name it after you as well because that's an amazing idea. Thank you for that. And Kendall was laughing because uh, I think he heard my note that I just asked him to, you know, help me remember. We got to write a, if we can write an ordinance about that, I think that is one way. Uh, of course, there's nuances to that. So we'll have to take that back to the team. Um, that's certainly a great idea to explore some. So um, without any further ado, thank you all so much for uh, the passion, the stories that you shared, the perspectives that you lifted up. Um, it's these kind of conversations that helps us um, in, in doing our job better. Um, of course, building strong neighborhoods, um, of course, is related to having safe neighborhoods, and we need your help to do that. I mean, y'all certainly did help us tonight. Um, we will be having more listening circles. Kendall, help me out. We have one in January. We haven't set the date, but what's the topic on it? homelessness and so I know some of y'all have um, reached out to us um, there are folks certainly in between homes right now um, with the pandemic it hasn't made um, life any easier for some of our neighbors um, and so we will be having a conversation about that um, in January stay tuned for the date um, we'll promote it as we always do to talk about those issues um, and as always I really enjoy these conversations because y'all allow um, for space for us to like take notes um, and take homework back to City Hall um, to work for you. So um, thank you all again. Um, yes, sir, please. And we got it. 30 seconds, please. <laughs> As a resident, we want to thank you guys for putting y'all's lives on the line. Our butts, you might say. Yeah. But I want, as a group here, I don't know if you're aware of your faith or not. You may not be able to legally do it on here, but I want to pray for every one of you guys. So we'll look, y'all bow your heads right now. Mm -hmm. Please. Father, we just come right now. You see each one of these officers. You see what they go through every day. 
they put their lives out there for us to protect us, to keep us safe. Lord, we ask that you put your angels around them and keep them safe. Keep them from harm. Keep them from getting shot. Keep them from getting sideways with an with a ill-ray person. Father, just send your peace with them everywhere they go, for they are peacemakers, Father. So how, allow them to be the peacemaker in the situation that comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. What better way to close than that? So um, thank you again, sir, for that. That was um, really, really meaningful to me. Um, thank you all um, for being here. Thank you to our PD team. Um, Y'all are um, just in, uh, completely amazing. I'm always speechless when I think about just the sacrifice that y'all make and the uh, opportunity that I get to work alongside y'all. So thank y'all again. We'll see y'all at the next one. We'll be hanging around, and we'll e we all have cards. Um, so please connect with us. We'll give you our information so that we can keep the conversation going. Thank y'all. Have a happy, happy holidays. Take care.